Welcome to the Paramedia Podcast. Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the Brown Pundits Podcast. Uh, we have with us today Vamsi Juluri. Uh, Vamsi is the professor of media studies at University of San Francisco, uh, is a well-known cultural and media critic and author of several books and a regular contributor to magazines, uh, blogs, and uh, the Indian Express. Uh, so I'm sure this will be an interesting conversation. Uh, so when we, before we start uh, with the topics, I would ask Vamsi to just tell us a little bit about himself, his background, and what he does. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join uh, you on Brown Pundits after having followed for many years and to also be back on Meru Media, uh, where we've had wonderful conversations in the past. Uh, so uh, a little bit about uh, myself and what I've been up to. Uh, yeah, I teach media studies at the University of San Francisco and uh, I also write books. I used to write books more frequently, but since they invented Twitter, um, and I joined Twitter about a decade ago, it's gone slow. Um, but um, here are a couple of my books. I'll just share them uh, with your listeners and viewers. Uh, Bollywood Nation, this was published by Penguin India about 10 years ago, uh, sort of a history of modern India through movies, um, you know, starting from the Falke era and the Telugu mythologicals all the way to Lagira Homunabai and um, more recent times. Um, and then uh, this is a book which um, got me tremendously happy, but also distracted and consternated in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, Mukunda and I have discussed this at length. This is Rearming Hinduism. And uh, I wrote this about 10 years ago. And uh, in a way, my life and a lot of the articles I've been writing the last 10 years, you know, in the Indian Express and earlier in the Huffington Post, uh, a lot of it, I think, ha have been the continuation of a journey that started with this book. Um, and um, right now, uh, I'm trying to read a lot of books because I want to try and write a new book uh, on the subject of propaganda, um, because the more I thought about this, the more I realized um, this is something adequate, uh, not adequately addressed by existing paradigms and research. So I'm hoping to um, produce a new book within a year, but at the same time, yeah, Hinduism is also something that's keeping me um, up at night in a sense, both in good ways and bad ways. <laughs> and that's what's been happening. So yeah, no, I, 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 go ahead, oh, more by. I was going to say that is a good point to ask our first question that what is Hinduism to you uh, and how would you define it or uh, describe it and uh, how should people, what should people think of when they hear the word Hindu? Wonderful. Uh, right now, I would say uh, the word you should, what you sh one should think of when you hear the word Hindu is gods, ancestors, nature, time. Those are the main things that are coming to my mind. Uh, well, God slash God. Okay, so I'll, I'll save that philosoph philosophical uh, debate for later, but you get you get the picture. I think and most of us with any sensibilities get the sense of how both, in a sense, work together. Um, but that definition was somewhat in a very seed form at this stage. Um, so I talk... Um, talk a little bit, of, I think, about uh, this new idea I've been trying to develop in my writing of the vertical and the horizontal. Um, so backstory a little bit, I think, for uh, listeners and viewers uh, who have not read some of my things in the past. Um, I grew up in Hyderabad uh, in the 1970s and 80s, um, went to a fairly cosmopolitan school. Um, in those days, Hyderabad was a very beautiful city, just rocks and boulders all around. Um, and my parents were very devout, um, you know, had a big puja room and used to go on pilgrimages once in a while, um, all those things. And I, by the 80s, um, I was never atheistic or anything, but I was certainly uh, not really ritualistic or practicing. And uh, I would try to avoid going for pujas or bhajans and things like that. Um, 
And of course, the big political thing that happened in the 80s was the Ram Janmabhoomi, uh, Babri Masjid controversy. And I think like most urban uh, English educated people of my generation, I really thought it was a big unnecessary hassle. And uh, uh, I would agree with many of my younger uh, friends and cousins who are very, very secular and opposed to this whole thing. But I would also be puzzled that, you know, very kind and generous people like my father, uh, you know, who grew up essentially in Nizami Hyderabad in the 40s, uh, who had tremendous love for everybody in his heart. And, um, you know, he was not the caricatured Hindu right kind of a person at all. Even he was saying, we have, I mean, this is some, at least one temple has to be given to us. So that puzzled me those days, you know. So these, that was sort of some of the generationally defining things that happened. Um, then the other big thing in my family, my parents became devotees of Sri Satya Sai Baba. Um, then in the 90s, I was at my least Hindu phase in a sense, in the sense that I was not practicing. I was not very interested in all of these, but I was doing my PhD and I was reading a lot of Marxism and the South Asia studies literature. And I was very excited about all of this. But eventually, I think I was in this very unusual position where I was sort of a, ended up becoming somewhat a somewhat devout Hindu in the middle of this very Marxist progressive company. And I somehow always thought the two of them could coexist. Um, and uh, then post 2000s, I began to notice there was an issue with Hindu misrepresentation in the media, you know, the California textbooks issue and so on. I began to write about it. And in 2014, when I wrote this book, this was sort of my, what as much as I understood about Hinduism at the time. So part one of this book um, is sort of my critique of Hindu phobia as I understood it then, which was literally, you know, uh, Edward Said, post-colonial studies critique saying, hey, we were a colonized country, so why why isn't it? Why don't we get to speak about our representations in the media and how they need to be more accurate or respectful? Um, and the second part of the book was just like a meditation on what I thought as the beauty of you know the philosophy of Hinduism, like the Upanishads and the Puranas and the stories of Krishna and Rama that we grew up with, the animal gods, nature. Um, that's where I kind of left off in 2014, and. Uh, I think I have a sense of what happened since then. The first few years after 2014, I think I ended up uh, just realizing how little I knew. Uh, both in terms of the first part, which was a critique of Hindu phobia, and uh, you know that there was a lot more which somehow we had not encountered in our uh, books. In, in in you know you don't find in any curriculum um, in the United States or in India for that matter. Uh, so I think I understood the political history a little more. And I also began to realize that um, there was a lot more to Hinduism than just the, you know, the self-help, uh, morality pursuit uh, level of it. That, I mean, there was, um, I mean, it was just mind-boggling, the complexity, the, the cultural traditions and so on. So uh, long story short, uh, I would say in the last few months, I've sort of come to uh, a simple answer and uh, in a sense I, I was almost uh, I was at a point the last two three years when uh, where I was saying you know I think um, a lot of Hindus particularly the western born Hindus who would always say we need to define what is Hinduism before we take on you know the problems of misrepresentation or Hindu phobia and I always felt like saying you know that's an impossible task in a sense so it's actually always an exercise in limitation and convenience when you try to say, what is Hinduism? We are all better off talking frankly about what is Hindu phobia, because that is a phenomenon, I think, which has a uh, strong, clear cultural, historical, political existence. And uh, so it's much easier to talk about Hindu phobia rather than Hinduism. Uh, but all the same, uh, I think it's useful to Talk, start with something positive. So I will say, as of now, um, my understanding of Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma is really uh, ancestral traditions, which means I recognize that it is very uh, uh, micro uh, uh, traditional, 
micro sampradaya in a sense um, that uh, for me Hinduism really more and more is just what I inherited from my father and mother and their influences and uh, you know the next generation will inherit from me and you know from my wife and so on so I think it is very very closely uh, localized show there are a lot of similarities there are a so, lot of similarities uh, but i'm finding it more useful to think of hinduism as a cultural practice in time or an investment in time over three or four generations and um, i've come to this sort of i think perspective uh one probably with getting old a little bit uh because uh i think by the time you're in your 50s nature uh, starts making you see time in a different way. And, uh, you know, it's almost like, uh, um, you know, you, you, there's a certain contentment and confidence you get about um, the big picture, which you just don't get when you're, you know, in your teens or 20s. Um, I mean, not all the time, not all the time, but uh, to a certain extent, you know, I can see um, that this is a long game. Uh, the other thing I think that also triggered this sort of thinking about Hinduism as something to do with time and uh, multi-generational existence and ancestors and descendants is uh, the two big uh, losses or events in my family in the last decade. 2014, November, my father passed away. Uh, uh, to this year, January, my mother, my mother. So the last 10 years, having lost mother and father and uh, in a sense, starting to practice these rituals fairly regularly, either the annual ritual or the monthly ritual in the case of my mother. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe towards the end, when we talk about the movie Balagam, we can come back to this. Um, I did not know, because until my father passed away, I never wanted to think about, you know, these kind of rituals and all. Uh, but once I, uh, you know, began to do these uh, ceremonies of the three rice balls and um, all these things, I somehow realized this is a worldview that is one expressed more through practice rather than through talk or commentary. And two, it is so much about uh, recognizing yourself as not as one body here, but really as some a consciousness that is always in a flow uh, of, you know, through time in a sense. Um, so I, I find that very, very promising and beautiful uh, because sometimes now I just think, oh, my God, it's like, you know, Lord Vishnu. Uh, there's a clip going on, going around of uh, Joseph Campbell, I think. I don't know if you've seen it. He says, Vishnu opens his eyes and the universe comes into being. So that is in my head and I have to share it. Uh, so, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I suddenly think, um, you know, from his point of view, um, what is... All of this, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, the last 10,000 years of history, which we are squabbling over, is like probably like one minute, like a five minute conversation for us. So from some cosmic uh, or perspective, um, you know, life is unfolding, I think, in much larger, harmonious, beautiful ways. And sometimes we perceive it, it makes us happy. And that's when I feel, okay, I'm tuned into Hinduism. <laughs> Is there, uh, like in uh, the four great Abrahamic religions, if I'm counting Marxism as one also, uh, there is a... Uh, at a micro level, every person is his own religion, right? He, he, what he believes in is inside his heart or in his mind is always going to be somewhat unique. But there is a common sort of catechism, right? There is a list of things that you are taught in school, these are the seven things, then you become a Catholic. Or these mm. are, you know, this is why you are a Muslim. Uh, but there is no such catechism, as far as I can tell, for Hinduism. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. How does the religion uh, sort of solve this problem of horizontal asabiya <laughs> being so micro sampadaya? No, great, great question. Okay, so um th this is uh, um, you know how i see it and uh, maybe i should mention some of my uh, the books i've been reading and my influences in a sense um uh, one i think 
I was interested in the generational point of view as a media researcher. I was interested in youth culture and intergenerational communication and so on. Uh, the other things are, um, yeah, so this is like the generational sociology kind of book. And, uh, but the other book, which is very directly connected to your question, uh, is, uh, you know, by Essen Bal Gangadhar as other seers. This is sort of a, a smaller version of, I think, uh, some of his um, more academic books. So Bal Gangadhar's work, this idea of generational so sociology, and uh, another author who I've really found valuable is the Native American scholar Wine D. Wine D. Loria Jr., um, who wrote an amazing book called God is Red, uh, early 1970s. And um, I realized that book, in a sense, was very similar to the experience of the ancestral or micro sampradaya or indigenous or polytheistic religions coexisting with the Abrahamic uh, giants, as it is, as it were, right? So he's talking about the Native American experience in relation to Christianity and, and the American colonization and so on. And uh, between Deloria and Bal Ganga, there's somehow, um, I think this is sort of how I've come to understand this, this attempt to find um, this lowest common denominator Hinduism is, uh, you know, I think it's sort of running its course now. Uh, it reached, just, I mean, it started maybe in the 19th century and uh, some people are still doing it. And I think right now what has happened in India, especially, is uh, kind of uh, the so-called Hindu nationalist uh, party is really just an Indian nationalist party where they've just said, oh, Hindu means Indian and uh, um, you know, sub ke saath, uh, you know, what is that? Uh, sub ka vikas. Sub ka vikas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sub, all that, you know, so they're all, you know, in a nice, uh, you know, very Gandhian uh, sort of uh, mode where they're saying uh, we're all one and India is our common, you know, factor here. And I mean, that that is certainly useful at, in terms of some practical, uh, uh, you know, at some practical level. And I mean, and I certainly I'm glad it has not turned out to be this angry, hostile, you know, Hindu Abrahamism, you know, uh, a that lot of people were afraid of that people were afraid of. Exactly. So but having said that, I think uh, there is a lot of concerning things about the way it has been playing out. And I will quote uh, one of the writers, I think, who I've learned a lot from in the last 10 years, who I didn't know about when I wrote Rearming Hinduism. And that is uh, Sita Ram Goel uh, and uh, Ram Swarup and Goel and Conrad Els. I think these people had produced some tremendous literature, which many of us in academia did not know about. Uh, and uh, which took me a while to also understand because I, you know, initially when you encounter some of these names or ideas, you have this category in your mind that, you know, these are all the Hindu right and um, you always think of the WhatsApp uncle forwarding something very dumb and mean. Um, and, uh, you know, if anybody under 20 is watching this, trust me, we've all been through that even before WhatsApp and Twitter <laughs> were invented. You know, what, WhatsApp uncles existed even before there was WhatsApp. I hope uh, um, you, uh, youngsters know that. So once you can tell, you know, the, the bad stuff apart from the substantive arguments, the reasonable debate, that some scholars like Goel and others are producing, uh, you start to see the real concerns. And there's a quote by Goel I, I wanted to mention. Um, it's a very famous thing, right? He says, the Sangh Parivar will lead Hindu society into a trap from which it will not recover. And, um, you know, the other thing is the biggest collection of duffers gathered in history. So, <laughs> and, you know, and I think now one is starting to see you know, the huge cost uh, for Hinduism and Hindus and this this tradition of micro sampradayas, nature, indigeneity, polytheism, diversity, uh, even as India seems to be prospering, you know, a secular, <laughs> um, you know, lowest common denominator idea of uh, India, the um, 
something very devastating is starting to happen, you know. And uh, so uh, to put it very simply, I think the last 100, 200 years, um, the gurus, the politicians, um, the so-called reformers, everybody's been obsessed with this idea of this, you know, five point or 10 point Hinduism to recreate Hinduism in sort of an Abrahamic template. And uh, it has helped to some extent, but then I think now, you know, it is starting to fall apart. So one small example, you know, that has been uh, uh, playing on my mind the last few days. Now, every time I see these small videos, uh, like on Instagram or somewhere, you know, where they say, do you know why we light a diya? Do you know why we put kumkum? And, you know, things like that. And, you know, now I'm, there is so much of that going on. And now I realize we should actually stop asking that question and just say, do you know why you're even asking this question? Okay. Because it would not have occurred to my grandfather or great-grandfather or great-grandmother to do it because they would just do what their parents did. Okay. Now, there probably were some, you know, uh, uh, negative things to that in the sense maybe they had strict codes about, you know, whose food they would eat and, you know, uh, touching, not touching the gods, all those, uh, you know, old-fashioned, traditional, orthodox things they had. Uh, but they didn't harm anybody as far as I know. You know, they didn't, you know, unlike in the Netflix movies, you know, uh, I, I don't believe any of our ancestors harmed anybody, nor were they fabulously wealthy or extracting surpluses from the laborers, nothing like that. They lived by their code of conduct, which was very ritualistic. That's, you know. Now, the question we need to ask is, instead of always trying to explain to ourselves and to our kids, oh, there is a rational reason why we do this. We need to ask the question, why have we arrived at this point where we even ask the question? Because okay. that way, we, have, we, we stop for a second and to use a common phrase these days, we reverse the gaze. You know, and that's where this book becomes uh, important, where we start to understand that the religion template or the Abrahamic point of view, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, Judeo-Christianity or Islam or Marxism or wokeism, all these things, it, it has come from a certain experience. A certain group of people had an experience in a certain place in history, and that has traveled. And they have been recreating their understanding, their story about the world, uh, which I think can be summarized actually in three or four points, right? This idea of creation, the idea of limited time, of apocalypse, the idea of Adam and Eve, or you know, a, a brotherhood of man, where on the one hand you are professing and pro proclaiming equality, but at the same time you are always having this obsession with the other uh, and demonizing them, you know, as pagan or heathen or you know, kafir or um, you know, Hindu nationalist or, you know, whatever new uh, slur they come up with. So I think it's important to understand uh, both accurately and with sympathy, you know, uh, you know, the experience of the other faiths. And that is something Hindus really have not done uh, because it has always been about reforming, you know. So it is about reforming or uniting, you know, the great bugbear. Yeah. You know, these guys think, um, hame unity chahiye, you know. <laughs> and what what is this man? I mean, you're not going to get it because you're not organized in space. Your religion or culture has never been about everybody from one continent to the other continent on Sunday morning or Friday afternoon mm -hmm. going to a place of worship and doing the same uh, you know, steps, and then also being asked to believe the same things. Okay. So, in a sense, this idea of uh you know, uh, one size fits all belief system or practice system or the chosen people. None of these have really existed. So I think in a sense now, you know, the Indian government under this present party is doing a lot of Indians as just chosen people stuff. So I think you can, you can add a fifth Abrahamism in a few years and that will be uh, Bharat Mataism. <laughs> right. I but hope I don't I get in trouble for that. <laughs> but uh, is there an... Uh, example in a place like the only one I can think of would be something like Japan mm -hmm. where there it is not an Abrahamic country in that sense right they have not converted to one of these four religions uh, they are still just Japanese 
and they have their traditions and their rituals and they have some things they have maintained. They maintain those rituals very, very exactly. They are obsessed with it actually. Uh, the, the building is made without nails or whatever, you know, that, that kind of thing uh, that even to the smallest detail, they'll try to just replicate the ritual and not bother about it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but is that an option in India uh, for people to treat their religion and their rituals? So, I mean, I have a thought on this, Aurobai. So part of this is like, I think there's this drive amongst Indians and Hindus to think about the religion in scientific terms, as if there's some some reason why we're doing this. That's like we can explain in a way that fits into our current scientific worldview that the West has provided us, and where everything has to have a rational reason that's connecting. Like this is why you get here. Stupid people say the vibrations will will you know women shouldn't chant the Vedas because the vibrations will destroy her embryo whatever. This is nonsense, right? Like there's a reason you don't need reasons. They have reasons within a particular tradition. They don't need to explain it. They just have a reason and they do it. Now, if you don't want to follow that tradition, then you have another tradition you can follow. And this, I think, is the the reality I think Hindus fail to sometimes get is not every tradition needs to be the same for everybody. It's like it, it's made. It, that's why there's hundreds of different traditions, thousands of different traditions. If you don't like Vaishnavism, go find Shaivism. If you don't like the Brahminical version, go find the non-Brahminical version. Right? There's this entire scope of different practices and different views. But the problem, I think, is Hindus want to become Abrahamized. We want to have this sense of like, oh, we we have one set of books, we have one set of authority, we have one set of way of thinking about the world, but we never this, had that. Does this come from? sort of a position of weakness uh, because as you know, Naipaul famously said, it's a wounded civilization. Uh, wounded but that only goes so far, Omar Bai. I mean, I mean, that only goes so far in, it, it's the sense of, I think, and I'm sorry if, if I'm talking but uh, too much here, but like, I think there has to be this sense that we have, woundedness only can survive as long as you don't fix the wound. Right. Like if you don't pay attention to it and let it fester, this is what's going to happen. But you have to fix it. Right. The action has to be taken up by us. And, and this is also why I think within the Hindu tradition, we don't have a problem with evil in, in a theology sense. The the texts are created in soteriological way. They're 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 coming as if we are suffering. How do we get out of suffering? Not why you're suffering. What why does that matter? Right. Exactly the same way you're saying, uh Vamsi, uh, uh G is why does it matter why you're doing the ritual? The ritual is going to give you some sort of uh, pala or fruit. Just do it and you'll find the pala or fruit. And this is the thing. It's the same thing a doctor will tell you. Like, well, you're going to go tell him, why do I need to do this particular injection? Can you tell me the chemical composition of it? Because I want to know how it works inside my body. Why am I going to take the medication? The doctor says, hey, take the medication. You take it. And then you'll either experience the results or you don't. And the same way, I think we have to approach what we find in these traditions, because it's not, we're not doxa based. It's but not about belief. Point, there will be patients who actually know what is in there and sure. who may know the reason why they are getting that injection. So it's not yeah. out of the question. No, it's not. But I do think there's limitations here too on that. But go ahead, uh, Vamsiji. Yeah, I think, you know, the, one of the limit recognizing limitations really is uh, the most wonderful thing that can happen to us, I think, as human beings, whether in a spiritual sense or in terms of uh, our education, you know, and I think that's what happened to me around 2014-15. I just recognized my limitations that, um, you know, there was a tremendous amount of literature and philosophy and uh, sampradayic density, you know, substance um, and, uh, you know, I said, this is incredible, you know, so it's, uh, um, and it took me some time to locate myself, you know, in terms of my trajectory with, uh, within or in relation to all of these. So, for example, when my uh, mother passed away earlier this year, and we were doing the rituals on the 10th or 12th day, the, the priest who came from the Raghavendra Swami temple in Hyderabad, which is a very orthodox Madhva tradition, you know, he was uh, remembering how my mom and dad used to go to the Sanskrit school and uh, donate and give fruits and biscuits to the little Vedic students there. And when, then he was also looking at the wall and he was saying something in Canada to his deputy priest, um, because there's a huge picture, life-size picture of Sri Satya Sai Baba, you know, which my mom got when she became a devotee. And they were saying something about him. 
And I didn't understand it, but, you know, obviously, you know, wanted them to recognize that while we were from a, we followed a very old, fairly old uh, orthodox tradition, we were also uh, believers or fans of this modern guru, you know, the love all, serve all, Afro hair, as some people call it, guru, who, you know, I, I believed, you know, was something special because my father told me actually. And then I took me a while and I said, yeah, I see no reason not to uh, out of tremendous personal experience, but different story. So I said this to the priest. I said, Sampradaya Guru is Madhvacharya. Adhunika Guru, Sri Satya Sai Baba. So there is a traditional Guru who started our lineage and I feel very honored that we still have a little connection to that. I, I, I don't know even a fraction of the great works, but I have friends who are very, very erudite. And then you had, you know, this pop star guru, quote unquote, from a subaltern caste, from a peasant community in a dirt poor village in Rayal Seema, and which is like the Sicily of Andhra Pradesh. And, you know, I mean, at least back in the day, you know. <laughs> A lot and, of movies still have oh, yeah, yeah, being exactly, a exactly. dangerous place, right? <laughs> yeah. And here he is. He comes along in the 1930s and you know says he's an incarnation of first of Shirdi Sai Baba and then later he says, uh, you know, Shiva and Shakti and all these things. And my father and mother just said, you know, he's an avatar of God and we're going to follow him. And so we, we basically added a new sort of sub-tradition, you know, in one generation. So I now see that, again, you know, I think when you're in your 50s, you look at time differently and you start to see the trends. Um, so in a sense, I think um, what is productive is to recognize, um, you know, that from one, if you look at Hinduism more and more in terms of just among you and your friends and families, what has been happening over three generations? And most importantly, what is it that you would like to do in the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life in terms of your cultural and pedagogic legacy, uh, you know, for the next generation or two. And that is where I think there has been a huge hit in the last 10, 20 years, because um, I, I notice these trends in intergenerational disruption a lot, because uh, uh, I, it may come across as a bit of a boast, but then I'm watching TV or uh, looking at the internet and reading a lot about this a lot more than my doctor and engineer friends so you will forgive me my you know sinful indulgence there but i do notice all these things i mean i could see the propaganda about hinduism was getting more toxic 7 8 years before when everybody was saying oh there's nothing to fear you know like oh yeah modi ji jeet liya you know everything is great you know <laughs> i was saying no man i mean i don't want to be the prophet of doom here but things are getting extremely ugly you know, uh, like this Sanatana Dharma is a disease and uh, like Corona comment in India, or so many things. Um, so um, I think I forgot the main question. Sorry. <laughs> we'll ask another question then. Uh, sure, sure. Because having discussed a little bit about Hinduism, and we could go on forever, right? That's like, yeah. uh, I remember a line from, this was a book by uh, Niraj Chaudhary. I didn't even know that. Well, many years ago, I saw he had a book about Hinduism. And uh, in that book, he had mentioned that one of golden rule is that you can never say this doesn't happen in Hinduism. Yeah, so right. everything you can imagine does happen in somewhere in Hinduism. You know, but, but but that's the line in the Mahabharata, right? Which which is found here is found elsewhere, but it's not found here is found nowhere else, right? right. This is the but, idea of, of Hinduism. And that's this goes to your point, Vansiji, where that's why it's difficult to define. Because exactly. what is so there is found here? So this so that job we can't finish in an hour. Yeah. But yeah. Let's it was, on. Sorry, I, I remembered your question. It was about the inferiority complex. So I'll just yeah. add one thing, and that may segue us into the Hindu phobia thing more, right. uh, if you want to. So, um, yeah, is it a wounded civilization? Yes. And what is the nature of these wounds? Uh, now, here's an interesting thing. I think the nature of these wounds um, cannot, at the moment at least, be understood within the Hindu cultural experience. Maybe in the future, it can be when something very fusion happen, uh, goes around. Can you explain what you mean by that? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what. So, see, for a long time, I thought I was understanding this wound through my training as a critical cultural studies, aka Marxist scholar, <laughs> right? Marx and Edward Said. And, you know, I said, this makes sense. I mean, why would my wonderful progressive colleagues in academia who are all the time fighting colonialism 
be this adamant in denying that hey you know there is a hindu experience just like how there was a you know a middle eastern experience of you know colonization which inspired said to write we also had ours and you know um now all that was not happening and i've started to see the limits of that paradigm and and i think i think very broadly uh, and this has sort of been a contribution of bal gangadhar because bal gangadhar was one of his big arguments is that the western world view which is the western social science whether it's functionalism or whether it's marxism uh is basically secularized christianity and i think i was intuiting a little bit of that in riyabing hinduism in the first part when i was talking about how history is written how the history of evolution or you know migrations in prehistory um and i guess that is razib bhai's domain so i will not get myself into a, <laughs> any uh, <laughs> mess there but i intuited at a very elementary level that there was a template to the way we were learning about aryan invasion or uh, african migrations or all these things but now i understand and i i think i have a handle and a name for that template and this is essentially the the christian world view which entered you know the the social sciences right through so, hegel right it started with hegel the phenomenology of spirit and then marx takes it up and then this flow of history is we get from the hegelian concepts very yeah yeah and and as bal gangadhar says that maybe there isn't really even a hindu world view right uh, the idea of a world view i mean we have worked with one we hypothesize one and we can do it now so the way i see it now and i wrote a piece in first post uh, i think 3 or 4 months ago um, and i said it was titled something like do hindus lack a sense of collective harm okay. so i i mean this was a somewhat more academic social science trained Uh, engagement with this question of course a lot of people say why don't hindus have unity you know uh, should we pray together should we have one god one language you know uh, no i understood this in the following way i i i think hindus are cultivating a sense of collective identity in a very different from way because it is just two or three generations old in a sense uh, the experience of mass society so the experience of being indian perhaps is a lot more vivid uh, uh, what i call horizontal uh, in this vertical intergenerational existence and horizontal and you know the idea of a horizontal hindu identity like a chosen people or even a uh, oppressed people you know it's very very rudimentary it's not very been very successful and um, as a form of mass mobilization i think you know in the indian secular thing whatever or whatever is modi ji sabka saath thing that is going to be the bottom line that's fine but at a global level i think we are talking about this tension or coexistence between transgenerational world views especially those which are anchored in a sense of sacred place or nature um versus something that's more monotheistic or dominionistic and so on um so what one trend i noticed to give you an example of this um, gunda ji hopefully this will make sense i always found it interesting so when on twitter somebody talks about a crime against a hindu some poor boy in the basti in north india is taking the ganesh idol out the police has shot him in the head because you know they were told you know don't immerse idols uh, or some some something happens to a hindu or like say in kashmir or in tamil nadu or in bangladesh this kind of collective pain or outrage is very very limited at best you have a few thousand people on twitter getting upset about it and a few people are doing things they're helping refugees and so on but news comes of one sundar pichai or uh, you know uh, uh that's the dollar but oh, yeah thank you <laughs> yeah yeah my my senior from school although i don't know him so <laughs> uh, uh, so when you hear about that everybody you know they're putting up all the memes like oh yeah you know our man so there is this easy identification of i think hindus with successful hindus you know whether it's modi ji or nadella or uh, um, or maybe even obama because once he said he has a hanuman in his pocket <laughs> but this idea of the hindus probably on the sl- uh, street even in their neighborhood who's suffering it somehow doesn't quite occur and 
I I feel it, a lot of it has to do with this lack of uh, historically there's not really been a worldview, whereas you know the modern world and the Abrahamic faiths do have you know a worldview which is very important and generations of scholars have whether religious or secular uh, have worked to interpret the current world within that. Now some of it may be very flimsy and you know oh yeah this is religious fundamentalism but some of it is pretty persuasive. So, for example, when I finally read our friend uh, Venkat's masterpiece, you know, creating a new Medina, I was struck by the fact that, you know, so much of the uh, Muslim League intellectual uh, arguments in the 30s and 40s were very similar to what the South Asia Studies faculty were saying about the California textbooks in 2016. Hmm. Yeah. And there is, you know, there is clarity and purity of thought there. Like, okay, we had an enlightenment, we had a worldview, we had a vision for the whole world. And, um, you know, we would like to, you know, resume pursuing it, you know. And um, and and uh, now, you know, with, with Hindus, you know, this, this collectivity, collective vision, collective action, collective identity, these are all very difficult. So maybe what I'm suggesting is whether it becomes a basis for collective action or survival or whatever, I don't know. But just in the pursuit of truth, I feel recognizing Hinduism as, again, a, a temporal rather than a spatial phenomenon as something, what has happened in everybody's families in the last two, three generations, what's likely to happen in the next two, three generations. That is, I think, something important to consider. And uh, inferiority complex, yes. I mean, there was an article, there have been two, three articles I'm, I'm sure you've seen on this decolon decoloniality and decolonization uh, business. Uh, one was in Indian Express, Pratap Bahanu Mehta wrote it, and uh, uh, I think our friend Prakash sort of responded to uh, it, yeah. and um, about uh, Sai Deepak's book. And there was another piece in some Western publication, I don't remember where, that phrase inferiority complex was used there. And um, so now this is very interesting. On the one hand, I, I think, um, I mean, by any popular definition of colonialism and decolonization and decoloniality, it's very, very petty and desperate to deny that just because you are Hindu, uh, or, you know, in a loose sense, you're not entitled to it, you know. Right. So I think that is our Abrahamic Marxist, uh, you know, uh, habit of hiding from the truth now. Um, I, but having said that, I also think there is merit in this criticism that unfortunately, there is a tremendous um, sort of inferiority complex, you know, you see it on Twitter. So I, I have this communication professor hypothesis about what happened with, you know, the Hindu movement, you know, the Hindu image in a sense. Uh, and please disagree or agree with me as you wish. I, you know, I think a lot of modern Indians or, you know, people from the subcontinent or even Westerners, you know, Till about 2010, 2015, sorry, 2010, 2015, many of us, especially who were in the, you know, who went to public schools or JNU or, you know, the more anglophilic uh, strata of society, did not have any encounters with the world of, you know, the RSS or the Sangh and so on. It was mostly through newspaper headlines and some very caricatured images. Now, 2014 15 when i first actually you know started listening to you know modi ji speeches and reading you know some of their literature like you know deen dayal upadhyaya's integral humanism i i felt like these guys were actually taking over the gandhian legacy you know they they wanted some kind of a you know very basic bhakti hinduism which was going to be very pluralistic but on perhaps on a slightly stronger turf vis-a-vis uh, you know, Islam and Christianity than say Gandhi was. Um, so I said, this is, you know, this guy is not going to turn India into a Hindu fascist Rashtra if, after having read Deen Dayal, that's what I feel. But having said that, I also did not see it coming. Maybe Sitaram Goel did. I did not see it coming that their idea of Hindu Rashtra or, you know, uh, India shining or India Vikas, whatever they call it, would be a continuation of the, you know, destruction of this vertical Hinduism. First with nature, with place, build, building up roads. Some and of that, 
But isn't that sort of the role? Modernity itself is exactly. destructive of that. It doesn't matter if it's Modi running the country or someone else. They exactly. are all going to become modern. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. So there's mo modernity. There is no critique of modernity uh, in the in in India today. I think from this quarters. So it's very sad. I mean, as uh, I mean, there are a few people. But is there, uh, while you are a little bit pessimistic about how things are going, yeah. uh, is there also isn't it also the case that uh, fifty years ago the Western world view was very self confident, right, Ex over confident? Mm -hmm. uh, but today that doesn't seem to be the case. They're still the dominant force in the world. Of course, they run everything pretty much. Mm -hmm. But it's not. There are cracks in the edifice, though. Uh, so yeah. you may be at a point of time where the dominant themes themselves will become uh, shaky. And that does provide opportunities, too. Yeah, I hope. I mean, yes, certainly, you know, I think their superiority complex days are coming to an end. Right. And I hope our inferiority complex days also come to an end. And certainly with accomplishments, you know, like... Uh, uh, whatever the, the space mission and science and there are, there are a lot of things positive you know I I think you know even despite my habitual pessimism of, about the world which you can uh, attribute to the prophet Marx maybe <laughs> uh, uh, I I I know I recognize there's a lot of optimistic things happening but I do see the need for you know this is what I'm trying to maybe get a little prophetic about that. We, there needs to be a revival of this sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, a, a space outside of modernity, because modernity is destructive, like you said, you know, it is it constantly is. environmentally, every socially destructive. And, uh, you know, so I think, unfortunately, the the sort of uh, Hindutva bandwagon, you know, as, as it is called, if you may still call it that, or the BJP bandwagon, is so rooted in it like for example mohan bhagwat ji right the same but they also have to they have to run a modern state uh, and they have to somehow be able to be modern enough to at least fight off the ones who are trying to to, to take it away from them who, who's trying to take it like the rival party you mean or... no no i meant no no not the rival party that would be civil war i was just <laughs> thinking that if india after all if it's not modern will be yeah. like uh, parts of Africa. It's just open field for everyone to come and take it. Uh, you you can't possibly be not modern. Can you? Well, I, I think that the model of modernity that they're in some ways aping from the West is the problem. It's not modernity in and of itself that can be the fundamental problem. It's the, the, the mixture of, like, I was going to say consumerism that's unfettered, plus uh, the idea that there's no repercussions to one's actions and those repercussions can be pushed off as far as, as you know, next generation. These are, these are debates and things that are happening within Western countries themselves. Too. Sure. But that, I mean, but, but this is something where, what I was saying is like, the, the point I think is like India, again, maybe through history in some sense is still behind the ball because they didn't have the industrial age to really go through, to deal with these concerns. They're suddenly thrust into the modern age from a, a, a very different age. Okay, but let's let's ask Vamsi about Hindu phobia. What is that, and where is that coming from, uh, and uh, how does it sort of play out, especially in the West? Okay, so uh, there's a history to this. Okay, I, I think this hopefully is easier to answer than what the what is Hinduism and our complicated right. relationship with modernity. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, certainly. So Hindu phobia. I mean, the term has been widely popularized, I would say, in the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, but it has a fairly long history. And uh, this history was, uh, you know, researched by a, a friend, uh, a Western Hindu scholar, uh, Sarah Gates, who was doing a PhD in Australia. And uh, she found that um, the term was in use by anti-colonial English writers, British writers, like in the 1800s, uh, 1866, 1883, um, you know, it was, you know, they were using the word, and it was a fairly common sense word to describe a feeling of, um, you know, prejudice or disgust or, you know, towards people of the Hindu faith or the, you know, traditions. Um, in the early 1900s, it was used by 
one of the earliest Indian scholars, a Bengali scholar living in the in the Bay Area, I think one of the Gadar Associated people, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, then Siddharth Patel uses it in the 50s. Then it's sort of very few usages. Then late 90s, 2000s, you know, you find, uh, I think, the new generation of Indian immigrants here starting to use it here and also in the UK. Now, what is interesting about this word is it's an attempt to describe something that people are feeling and perceiving to be true. And what is strange is that the tremendous amount of denial, right? First, you had the academic sort of uh, establishment saying, oh, no, no, Hindu phobia is a myth, or it's a right wing word concocted by, you know, some right wing, uh, you know, internet personality. And even when people are saying, hey, look, here's uh, evidence. It has been in use since 1860s or whatever. It was an anti-colonial world. They pretend this discovery was not made. Uh, so I think there is a need for a scholarly uh, discussion and conferences and research and all these things. But unfortunately, again, the Hindu community here just um you know uh, hasn't really invested in supporting scholars so it just becomes a internet hashtag and it will come and go but what is it i would say uh historically um if you go back say 2000 years or you go back uh, maybe about uh, 20, i don't know 50 60 generations it is clearly um a category of othering. It is a, a, a term uh, for the other that comes out of the, um, you know, uh, Abrahamic worldview, I guess. So should I call it Judeo-Christian or Christian Islamic? I mean, I think the historians can debate that. Um, now, whatever it was in Judaism, I think because India didn't encounter it in a colonial sense, somehow that never really comes up. But certainly with Christianity, uh, the idea of the pagan or the heathen. It starts there. Oh, I think Judaism is not a religion that looks for converts, so they are not interested. Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is a missionary issue. Yeah, I mean, they, they have the worldview, but they're content, you know, they, I mean, right. uh, with what they have. Right. So I with, mean, everyone is false to them, so it doesn't matter. I mean, they're, they're equally false to <laughs> Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it, Yeah. yeah. So there's a great book by Sitaram Goel called Hindu Christian Encounters, um, I think AD 300 onwards or something. So the earliest encounter he has is there were apparently some Hindu temples uh, somewhere in, I guess, modern day Syria, uh, you know, the traders who were there and uh, some of the earliest uh, Christian converts there actually went and destroyed it. And, um, and then over the centuries, you find, you know, that there was this figure of the heathen that they had. Of course, the first heathens they attacked were, you know, in Europe itself. Uh, but eventually, the whole heathen and pagan hate thing uh, physically came towards India. And, uh, you know, starting with, you know, the Portuguese invasion and inquisition and all these things. Um, and then you also have the, um, you know, Arab, Persian, Turkic, the, you know, the coming of Islam into India, which also had a religious conversion uh, aspect to it, which again, a lot of, I guess, academicians and historians now don't want to accept at all. Um, so I think there is, you know, the, the, you know, the idea of the Hindu phobia is in a sense, um, uh, an iteration of, I guess, pagan phobia or kafir phobia or heathen phobia, call it what you will. It's a great book called Heathen, I just finished reading. Um, it talks about the figure of the heathen in American history. And it's incredible, the similarity, the stories these guys, they had in the 1800s and 1900s, whether of Hindus in India or uh, sometimes even of Africans and uh, Hawaii, where the fires just took place in Maui. Uh, incredible similarities, you know, so same tropes that have been coming for the last two, three hundred years. So, so, so how do you respond to the fact that there's so one of my frustrating things is many, many American academics um mostly of South Asian origin, whatever, um, and they many of them teach in South Asian departments, will vehemently and adamantly claim there is no such thing as Hindophobia, right? They're, they're very clear on this. There's no such thing. Islamophobia, definitely there is, but Hindophobia, there's no such thing. So you find hashtag no such thing as Hindophobia on Twitter all the time, right? And, and, the, and the question I have to you is, what are they 
either missing or what am I missing in in understanding if there is or is not Hindu phobia? I mean, I mean, and specifically, um, let's focus on Indian origin <laughs> academics. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Why would they insist that there is no such thing so vehemently? And they do. They insist very vehemently that there is no such. Thing. No, that's a great question, uh, uh, Umar Bhai, because I'll tell you, this is can be something that can be understood anecdotally through per my personal experience of being in academia last 30 years or so. Very simply, a lot of the Indian or South Asia studies type people, they mistake their personal privilege for some kind of collective Hindu or Brahmin privilege or upper, upper caste privilege. It has never occurred to them that many of the poor people they see in India, you know, for whom they have studied Marx and want to change the world and all that, happen to be Hindu. They are the people who are fighting to keep the temples going. They are the people who are fighting, um, and they they are the people voting for Modi. Let's face it, because they hope Modi will say not only give them you know roti kapta makan but also mandir, you know, in whatever form. I mean, it's a pity that's. Mandir business has become a spectacle and tourism and eco-destruction. You know, that's a slightly different concern. But the poor are Hindu in India. I mean, so there is this very distorted understanding, I think, uh, many, uh, you know, South Asia studies academics have, where they sort of project their own family's uh, privilege, maybe because their parents came here in the 60s and, you know, worked for NASA or IBM or, you know, did well in life. And then they will add to that some personal anecdotes. And unfortunately, there are personal anecdotes. You know, you some of them might be real, like, you know, a father or mother who said something mean about somebody's community. That could, that happens. It happens so in that, every community. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, but, yes. But anecdotally, uh, my own sort of limited experience, uh, those people did not seem to be so much concerned with their own privilege or anything. Uh, but the ones I know, I don't know, it's just a sampling thing were almost uniformly Marxist yeah. and or, or thought of themselves as some of them are not Marxist. They like the term Marxian or something or <laughs> Marxist lens or, you know, there's all kinds of ways yeah. of trying to say they're, they like Marx, but they don't really like Marxism. Uh, but whatever it is, it comes from certain, a certain sort of left wing ecosystem in India. And why is that ecosystem uh, so sort of like this? Uh, is there uh, are they right are they wrong why are they wrong yeah no i'd say they're wrong because simply again i i was trained in that ecosystem and i think i was the outlier in the sense that i had to figure out a way to keep my respect for what whatever i learned from marxism which is understanding this inequality and understanding the causal relationship between wealth exploitation and poverty all of that you know i haven't let go of that um uh, and in a way, Gandhian thought was sort of a bridge for me, I think, from Marx to a critique of modernity. Uh, so I didn't, I, I think I I studied Marx as a, as a social commentator and not as a prophet or religious guru, you know. I kept my guru on the top shelf and Marx below him. <laughs> so that's kind of how I turned out like this, I think. Uh, but yeah, no, Hindu phobia is real. I mean, you know, it's it's just incredible that but people. is it hmm. what is it about these people that makes them say uh, be like this? Uh, what is it that what threat do they see, or what what is their aim that they feel is under threat from so called sort of Hinduism? Two things. I think at the personal level, it could be just uh, it. A lot of it is also um, a mistake on the part of. Uh, the emerging Indian right-wing ecosystem or nationalist ecosystem. I think there was a window in time, like about 10 years ago for a few years, when um, a lot of uh, you know young people could have been persuaded that there is a Hindu grievance and uh, the answer to the grievance, you know, the kind of the liberal Hindu thing, kind of like in my rearming Hinduism book, you know, which is a bit Gandhian and, you know, which just says, hey, um, Let's stop denying what happened in the past, but also let's not uh, use that to, you know, call for revenge or anything now. Let's all get along now. But, you know, let's also, you know, some, you know, in a very, you know, sabka saath. That was my sabka yeah, saath. Kumbaya, my, you know, let's all kumbaya together. Yeah, right kumbaya, about. right, yeah. right. Now, now, what happened was, I think, unfortunately, the last 10 years, 
these guys, because of their famous anti-intellectualism or the fact that they're not really about Hinduism as much as nationalism, uh, they ended up, or maybe it's just the coming of Twitter and social media and the wider polarization that has also happened in the US, right? This right-left split has happened in a very big way. So in the last, ten, and also a generational change. So I think as a result of all these issues, um, it's become very hard now. So early 2000s, I still had some of my Marxist friends who appreciated what I wrote, uh, you know, because they would listen to what I had to say. You know, I think right until that essay, Hinduism and its culture wars in 2013, uh, there was dialogue with a lot of my, uh, Marxist colleagues and friends, and it was always respectful and friendly and all that. The last five, seven years, you know, that has declined. Yeah, um, so look, let me ask you this question, right? So many, many times these same people um, mm -hmm. will, will, and many of them are based in the U.S., right? And their response to, for example, let's say in the South, uh, uh, people pulling down the statue of a Confederate soldier and, you know, putting up something else or destroying Confederate landmarks or um, white, privileged white uh, landmarks or so on and so forth, they're lauded, right? You know, oh, good job. We fought the colonizer, the oppressor. But the same thing when you look at India and you see, like, for example, like renaming the road from, mm -hmm. you know, Aurangzeb Road to whatever they call it now. It's, Abdul oh, Abdul yeah, 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 Abdul Kalam. Oh, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is Hindu nationalism. This is, what I find is there's this dichotomy that I just can't reconcile when they're, they see one people as being the oppressor in this situation in America. But in the other situation, another same invasion kind of thing story happens. The only difference is the the people that are invading still remain for the mm -hmm. for a, in in a significant number, right? So like uh, like if, if today it's like you know if uh, instead of calling it New York, if if someone wanted to go back and call it whatever it was called before, uh, you know the the Dutch came over, you know mm -hmm. people would be like, yeah, let's do it. But mm -hmm. the same thing happening in India would be like. This is horrible. I mean, isn't that in and of itself a case of like Hindu phobia, like the idea that that you shouldn't be able to call things back to where it was before? I don't know. Just some thoughts. Yeah, I I think so. The the, the sort of conclusion. I mean, Hindu phobia people might look at it uh, in, uh, through history, through psychology, through different perspectives. But as a media researcher, yeah, uh, um, you know, the one small peer reviewed publication I got out, which was a methodology for studying Hindu phobia and media representations, like, uh, you know, a typology of tropes and uh, themes, uh, like, you know, how do you recognize something as Hindu phobic if you see it in the media? Um, so I, I laid out a whole grid in this uh, chapter, and maybe we can, I can, we can share the link Later sure. Yeah. Uh, so at the end of it, I define Hindu phobia very simply as a form of propaganda, because now, especially the last ten years, the only explanation I could arrive at ultimately, you know, for the kind of questions you thought about, you know, and uh, because it's the same thing, I thought from two thousand six when I first wrote about Hindu issues, you know, starting in the textbook California textbook issue in the Chronicle. Uh, Till about 2016 or 17, I really thought there was I was going to be like this liberal bridge builder between Marxist academia and you know <laughs> the the angry unruly Hindu crowd or whatever. And it was my naivete in a sense. Uh, but I you know the divides are deep, and a lot of the divides, some of it is politically I think orchestrated uh, because it it is you know everybody inherits divide and rule. So I think. You know the the BJP ecosystem now you know has figured this out. You know, let's let the you know let's keep the spotlight on all these people who are hating on Hinduism, like you know the DMK, Stalin, and whatnot. Um, and you know uh, says, look, look, if you don't vote for us, they'll come. And what is their idea of Hinduism? Of course, again, it's basically touristification. Mohan Bhagwat saying, oh, we oppress you for two thousand years, so now for two hundred years you have to suffer. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I mean, the guy is more woke than the wokiest person in in an American high school today. You know, the venerable Mohan Bhagwat. But in a way, uh, don't you think that is also uh, you can tell your anti-Hindu phobia friends that uh, that is proof that there is these people are actually pretty harmless. 
Uh, see, this goes back to the inferiority complex point. See, see, when I first personally met people from this um, uh, community, the crowd, the, uh, the Sangh Parivar or whatever, like uh, seven, eight years ago, that, that's the first thing that occurred to me. These are harmless. You know, these are like, you know, the forest gums of India. They're very patriotic. They're civic minded and all that. But two unfortunate things have happened. One is their severe anti-intellectualism and their kind of their own colonial mentality in a sense. You know, I have a friend uh, in UK who always uses this phrase called half colonized, full colonized. So by full colonized, he means the South Asia Hindu phobic crowd, you know, who are completely rabid and disconnected from reality and they're defending their colonial worldview. Um, and then you have the half colonized people who know there's something wrong. But then, you know, their answer is, you know, we need to reform, we need to reform, you know, without recognizing that they're, they're all playing Martin Luther, you know, they're playing yeah. Martin Luther G, you know, so <laughs> that's about it. Um, so I think that that is a dilemma. So yeah, the inferiority complex, how do people who are harmless get portrayed as a threat? I think what has happened is, and this is just my personal hypothesis, until 2014-15, most of us did not really know who or what the sung was, at least I did not. And there was this impression of them first as these very tough, serious people, you know, who were anti-Muslim and all that. And then when you listen to Modiji's speeches and you meet some of them, you realize they're trying to be very Gandhian and they're harmless, as you put it. But unfortunately, what has happened since then, I think this is because of the media technology and times we live in. Everybody's on Twitter. Everybody's babbling away on Twitter. So I think a weird thing has happened where on the one hand, people do realize they're harmless, but at the same time, people also can see there's a lot of pettiness. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, lot just of anger. anger, exactly. Twitter anger. So it has become very easy now to maintain the story, you know, the propaganda story that, you know, these guys are Nazis and they're going to take away, you know, citizenship for 200 million Muslims. And but that, that brings up the question. To, to, it always strikes me that the easiest sort of answer to all of these things is uh, for you to ask them, why is India being held to a standard that is applied to no one else? Mm -hmm. Right? There is a, uh, forget about whether Hinduism is good or bad or whether BJP is evil or not. They are evil, they are bad, whatever. But similar bads and similar evils then exist in America, in England, in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, much higher levels exist in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but we treat them as normal countries. How come these people are treated differently? I think that is the Hindu phobic or pagan phobic uh, axis, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, they, they are trying to avoid confronting the fact that um, there is a mess in their solutions you know there is a mess inside them you know that uh, you know that cannot that has to be addressed you know um i, I mean yeah i mean that's the only uh, i don't know i i, I don't know to say yeah yeah Okay, let's, you know, we'll run out of time. We'll have to do this another time and do some more uh, detailed stuff also. But I, because I wanted to go on to another topic before we finish, and that's yep. the, uh, films and uh, sort of soft, tech, soft power exports. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it that uh, I know you are a fan of Indian cinema or at least an expert on Indian cinema? Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about Indian cinema and the role of cinema in all these culture wars? All right, so it's very interesting. The last two, three years have been very exciting and I got to teach my Indian cinema class last year after many, many years, uh, up to seven years. And um, a lot of controversies, of course, you know, Kashmir files that you know, came out towards the end of that, RRR and, uh, you know, uh, Pushpa and all these things, a lot of things happening. Uh, but I wanted to make one observation, like in my Indian cinema class, we started with uh, a discussion about Basically, I guess what you could call wokeism in Indian movies, um, because, you know, Netflix had put out a statement saying it was losing a lot of money in India. And at the same time that this movie, a real mass movie in Telugu called Pushpa, had become a huge hit. So they, we had a big discussion in our class about this idea of nativity, you know, the idea that cinema 
has to reflect and express a kind of uh, organic, you know, Indian experience and aesthetics and sensibilities. Um, and more and more, you had the bigger other two big industries, mainly Bombay, the Bollywood or Hindi industry, which had become very corporatized, sterile. It was coming out of a bubble. So they were making all these movies, which I think the one percenters of India literally uh, were liking. You know, so in fact, when I played one of the Bollywood movies, I forget the name, um, you know, my, my American students, the first thing they said is, it does not feel like it's in India. I mean, the gym and, you know, the apartment, the clothes, the cars, the malls, this could be taking place in any city anywhere in the world. Whereas you put on something like Pushpa and you just get that feeling of, you know, of the street or the village and all that. Uh, but specifically, there were two movies which sort of, I think, uh, would be a nice note to wrap up on. And uh, that is, uh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to show this one book. I apologize for the diversion. I, I just finished reading it by Anand Ranganathan, Hindus yeah. in Hindu Rashtra. So, yeah, this is the problem with the Hindu phobia issue, right? I mean, it keeps coming back again and again. So I won't talk about this because we should end on a happy note, but please do read it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. On the happy note, on the dismal note, yes, Hindu phobia constitutionally enshrined. Read this. On the happy note, two movies, uh, Kantara and Balagam. Uh, and I want to end this on the a personal note and on a note of, I guess, what I meant by the vertical. Uh, these are all concerns of the horizontal, the mod modernity, colonialism, Hindu phobia, all that stuff. We'll put it aside. It's, it's so strange now that I think about it. I watched Kantara just a few days before we realized my mother had not long to live. So I watched it in November uh, last year. And uh, I watched Balagam in February or March after she passed away. So what is it about these two movies? Uh, Kantara, uh, uh, well, in both these movies, you see at one level, both these movies are about the vertical, what I'm calling the vertical, which is the intergenerational integrity, continuity, the way it's trained, the way it's disrupted, and the way it gives us meaning and belonging and a sense of continuity with nature and life and existence in a way that ideologies and slogans and beliefs simply don't. And uh, so Kantara, I liked because uh, it actually reminded me of a book. Oh, God, I'm being very professorial here. I apologize. Uh, I found another book by Wandy Loria called The World We Used to Live In. Okay, beautiful book. So uh, Deloria in, uh, compiled the ethnographic reports uh, left behind by late 1800s, early 1900s um, Americans and scholars, anthropologists, missionaries. Interviews of Native American holy men and women, like shamans in a sense, I guess, right? And just matter of fact, what they told them, like the guy will say, you know, I was I, walking in the desert, I fell asleep, one crow came to me and it started talking uh, in my ear. Then I became a crow, I flew away. So things which seem absurd or magical or unbelievable. But you realize just three, four generations ago, people in this land in North America were living like that. There are still people who probably practicing all kinds of things we don't even know, you know, do we call it hallucination or culture or tradition or alternative Star Trek reality, who knows, but Kantara, you know, in a sense was also like that. It was about, you know, the devatas and, you know, the deities and very, very powerful, especially the last 30 minutes of the movie, it, it uh, blows you away. And uh, um, you're on mute, Omar Bhai. Or, yeah, please do. I know you've seen it, Omar Bhai, please share. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say, yes, I saw the movie and it was good. Uh, I enjoyed the movie. I think that, that and it was different, right? I, I mean, I don't see a lot of movies, so uh, not a lot of Indian movies, at least. So, so maybe I'm missing the that side of it. But so for me, I, I, mean, I love the movie. I thought it was a fantastic movie. So I have been in the presence of of Siddhas who have channeled, you know, gods and goddesses and, and done that. You know, there was, there was one that was... Um, is from Vijay Varda, uh, Mukhar Narsimachar, who used to, uh, who's known to channel Narsimha through him. And his personality would change and 
it would be very so I've seen this stuff so it was very visceral to me and both the movie sense I did a beautiful job of of capturing the I think the disconnect between the the like you said the verticals right but also the way to repair that vertical exactly. the way yeah go ahead go ahead, sir I mean, yeah, I mean, that's so beautiful. So because I, when I was a child, I mean, I've seen some things like this. And then obviously my elders used to talk about it in a very matter of fact way, like it was real, you know. And, you know, the last scene in the movie, I mean, I mean no spoilers. I'll try to say it without spoiling it. Uh, I mean, there is a profound sense where this young, youthful character who's like the village hero and, you know, no good guy in a sense who's partying and drinking and just having fun reconnects with his dead father, right? in Kantara. That, so that was such a profound, profound, mind-blowing moment. So where that, you know, it's a traditional cultural role. I grew up, you know, among performers like that because my mom was involved with promoting and supporting these traditional art forms. Uh, so Kantara was very beautiful. And I wrote an article in American Kahani called Nindu Kunda Pavitra Patra, which translates as sacred role, Pavitra Patra. Yeah. Nindu Kunda is an expression in Telugu. I don't know if you have it in other uh, Indian languages, uh, Nindukunda just means a full vessel or a full pot. Huh. So the idea is if, sorry, a stable person. A stable person, yes, sir. That's it. You know, like so. If you're content, you're stable. You know, you're not going to be nasty or mean to anybody. You're just yourself, and everyone likes you. You like everyone. So my dad was sort of a Nindukunda kind of a person, and Pavitra Patra. My mom played all these goddess roles. So I kind of played, uh, paid a tribute to my parents uh, after watching Kantara. I think this was in November or December. January, yeah. my mom passed away even while I was on the plane on my way to India. Uh, and then after coming back, uh, my friends told me uh, uh, there's this movie called Balagam, which literally means strength or community. Uh, the strength you get from community. Mm -hmm. So very funny movie. It's set in a small Telangana village where the grandfather has just died. So all the family members start coming and gathering for his funeral. And it starts off as a bit of a dark comedy, you know, like a set, very typical satire. So nobody's even really bothered he's, that he's died. They're just going through the rituals. Everyone's got their own worries. You know, one person is worried about um, the inheritance, another person about something else. And then one problem starts, which is they have to uh, feed the crow. I mean, they, have, they do the puja and keep the rice balls and uh, keep the food. And the sentiment in the village is that if the crows come and eat it, that means uh, Tata, grandfather's soul is happy. But it doesn't happen. The crow is refusing to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts with this very comedic, uh, small town, you know, uh, art movie kind of premise. And by the end of it, man, it is so profound. Because again, see, this is the verticals, you know, in a sense is also, to use another word, Jati Parampara. Yeah. So when people talk broadly and loosely about an, an annihilating caste, they're not realizing that, you know, it is okay. Talking about annihilating caste oppression or atrocity or inequality, yes, that is commendable. But if you come up with this blanket cultural genocidal phrase, right. you are talking about the very subaltern communities who are so deeply connected to the traditions of their fathers and forefathers and and it varies okay so they, they offer the right like th that is their support uh you can see that there is a difference right between that kind of traditional poverty and the poverty of the people in san francisco uh so, is it's night and day different those people have a life they have a structure they have families they have clan you know they are the, the even the lowest caste person in his own family and clan could be an elder could be someone that someone looks up to uh, this is not the case in San Francisco. Uh, these people have nothing to look up to. Uh, and yet people want them to become like this. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is the modern, the dark side of the modernization zeal, you know, whether it is coming from the nationalist right or the Marxist left in India. You right. can't destroy Balagam. You can't. De but here's uh, the thing, right? It comes down to two things, I think, for me. One is identity is relationship right because identity helps us build bonds because we connect with each other right so these these jati groups whatever they, they have identity that lets them be hey we're one we're we're someone if you got us and what a modernity does it tries to get rid of identity right it tries to get rid of identity to make you a commodity to make yes. you a thing 
And and I think this is the problem. That that's one. But on the good note, I, I want to leave on like just you said the, the happy note. Well, so I lost my father in twenty in twenty twenty two, the beginning of of uh, of twenty twenty two. So I remember doing the the full year of masakums, right? You know, every month you do your the shardam, the pindas, and all that stuff, right? And that process, you know, it's I think I learned so much more about my father and his beliefs about this than I ever did talking to him in some sense. And and then connecting deeper to his ancestors and what they believed and how they saw the world and how what was so important to them about this process. And to be shorn of that, I think it's like it's it, it can be it can be uh deeply painful because this is something that uh, no other way to connect to our past, but through these rituals and these connections that, you know, they did that. I'm doing the same thing. They, they did the same way they're doing it. And, and there's something there, right? I don't know. It, it, I think there's something beautiful about that. There's a chain, there's a chain link connecting us to whoever the first person that started it, or maybe it never started. I don't know, but it's connecting. I don't know, but that's, that's part of divinity, right? In some sense. Yeah. And I mean, the way I see the, the, the divine <laughs> perspective, you know, uh, in, in a sense, I even as I, I, I think I wrote a little bit in the Nindukunda article in American Kani, you know, this, what is the greatest goal in Hinduism, for lack of a word, a better word, let's say you call it moksha. Yeah. I think we tend to think of it in the modern world as an individual quest, you know, uh, but I think in a sense, it is intergenerational. So it is a continuity, you know, like in the sense that I believe very um, fervently that in a sense, in some form or the other, our ancestors are very connected to us even now. And uh, and we will be towards our descendants too. I mean, if you have them, you know, either directly or indirectly or whatever. So, but it it is all, you know, like Vishnu opens his eyes and this everything emanates and you know from formlessness it, it starts taking form and from his time point i mean think about it a billion years have passed by the time he has uh you know fluttered an eyelash and then the whole of evolution has happened and <laughs> you know the consciousness has acquired you know uh eyes and gills and you know crawled out onto the earth and then hands and limbs and wings and uh e eventually uh, uh you know a tongue and the capacity to talk and here we are you know at least in this universe assuming there are parallel universes and given the vastness of this temporal uh, sweep which is reality you know uh, and how little we even perceive it or enjoy it or marvel at it most of the time because we're more worried about Monday morning or uh, <laughs> 10 years from now uh, I think that is the beautiful thing and uh, again, as, I think as a media uh, researcher and a teacher, uh, I feel the best thing we, we can do is understand because we're all media consumers, we're all media producers now. Uh, just recognize that, um, you know, we could use these tools also to celebrate uh, eternity, to celebrate our connection to time. So let's connect to each other, not only horizontally across ethnicity and caste and religion, you know, which is the Kumbaya thing we are familiar <laughs> yeah. with. But let's also have this intergenerational kumbaya. Why not? Right. right. No, that's <laughs> great. We will we will end on this happy note. Uh, we do have other things that we want to talk to you about. So we have to get you back because we didn't even touch on what is probably the single most like the super weapon uh, is caste, right? <laughs> and uh, and why and how that came to be the identifying feature and not the whether it's the identifying feature or not is less important actually the one thing that sort of defines every Hindu and is the reason why they should actually give it up as far as the good people are concerned is because of this so-called institution. Yeah. Uh, so in any case, we'll talk about that some other day. Thank Perfect. you very much, Vamsi, for having uh, this talk with us. We look forward to having you again. Thank you, Mukunda. Yeah, thank uh, you both. Yeah. We look Pavan Muni Jan Yamuna Tire Pavan Muni Jan 
यमुनातीरे गायती वनमाली गायती वनमाली मधुरम गायती वनमाली 